It looks like we've got a good number on the line now, still a few folks coming in, but I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome again, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, on behalf of FCM, I'd like to, to begin the session first by acknowledging that we are meeting on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for thousands of years. And we at FCM recognize the Algonquin Anishinaabe people as the traditional custodians of the land uh, upon which FCM's offices are located and uh, where I myself am currently situated. And we also recognize the contributions of Métis, uh, Inuit and all First Nations, both in, in shaping and strengthening this community and, and country as a whole. Uh, so wherever you are, please join me in, in paying our respects to the original stewards of this land and committing ourselves to, to thoughts and actions that will lead to meaningful re reconciliation wherever we live now. Uh, so I'd encourage you, if you feel comfortable doing so, to add your own acknowledgements to the chat. And if you are looking to learn more about uh, Indigenous lands or are unsure of which lands on, uh, you are currently located in, um, we're going to post a link in the chat as well to a website uh, created by Native Land Digital that maps out traditional territories, languages, and treaties of Indigenous peoples around the world. Um, it also has lots of other resources that can help you learn more about why we do these acknowledgements. This is an important part of, of recognizing our, our history and our continued impact as we work towards a more sustainable and equitable future for everyone. So today, the uh, topic of our presentation is community buildings. And uh, this webinar is a first look at our new initiative, the Community Buildings Retrofit Initiative, uh, and how it supports municipalities to improve the performance of these buildings. Uh, my name is Yvonne Ritchie. I work with the Green Municipal Funds Capacity Development Team, and I will be your moderator for today. So I will uh, start us off with a, a brief introduction and then transition over to our speakers uh, to give the presentation. Uh, so the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, or FCM, as, as many of you know, is the, the national voice of local governments in Canada. And our mandate is uh, to deliver programs that build municipalities' capacity to deliver innovative, cost-effective, and local solutions to environmental challenges uh, and to enhance quality of life uh, for, for those citizens. The Green Municipal Fund is our largest program and is funded by uh, the Government of Canada. And it supports municipal initiatives in sustainable development through both funding, uh, as well as resources to help share uh, knowledge and lessons learned uh, through online tools, trainings, uh, events like this one, and, and in peer learning and more. Uh, over the past 20 years, uh, GMF has supported initiatives uh, centered on uh, waste, water, energy, land use, and transportation specifically. Uh, this is what we typically refer to as our core funding program. And in addition to this core funding, our mandate grew in 2019 to include four new initiatives, uh, community efficiency financing, sustainable affordable housing, uh, low carbon cities Canada, and uh, the new community buildings retrofit program. So today we're excited to share more about the community building retrofit initiative, um, which was recently launched this past month, and which aims to help improve energy performance and reduce GHG emissions in community buildings. Uh, <clears throat> so today we're going to cover um, some of the opportunities that exist to help you not only reduce CHG emissions, but to save money in your existing community buildings. Uh, we'll walk through a series of key steps that you're uh, to, to follow for your community buildings to most effectively realize these GHG and cost savings. Um, and we'll talk about what's included in the uh, community building retrofit offer itself. So what supports are available and at which steps of the process to help you achieve those goals. Um, so before we dive into the content, we just have one uh, short poll for you with a, a couple questions, uh, which will help us uh, better understand who, who's joining us online today. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and, and open that up on uh, the screen now. The, uh, the first question is, uh, where are you joining this webinar from today? Um, of course, folks have already been putting, putting their, their, uh, their names and, uh, and municipalities in the chat, which is great, but uh, just trying to get a sense of, of which provinces are represented as well. Uh, the next question is, what type of organization do you work for? And then the final question is, approximately how many people live in your municipality? So we'll give a few more seconds for folks to answer. Still seeing lots of responses trickling in. Seems like we've got pretty good representation, of course, from Ontario, as well as uh, a number of the Atlantic provinces. And uh, uh, the vast majority of folks are from uh, our municipal staff so far as well. And a pretty good range across the board in terms of uh, number of people. We've got about a quarter in, in each of the, the, the four groups there. So a quarter less than 10,000 and, uh, and then a number in, in the other categories as well. 
there you can see the results on the screen there. But uh, thank you very much for, for your input. It helps us kind of get a picture of, of who's joining us on the line. All right. So without further ado, I am pleased to uh, introduce our presenters for today, uh, Juliana Fanus and Patrick Kehoe, who are both staff members here at GMF. Juliana is a project officer with our sector development team, and her work involves supporting the development and implementation of sector specific, specific initiatives to better address the needs of Canadian municipalities. Uh, Patrick is an advisor with our programs outreach team and is your number one resource for any questions about the community building structure fit funding offer. Uh, both Juliana and Patrick have a wealth of experience working with Canadian municipalities on, on different sustainability initiatives and are here to help equip you with the information and the tools that you need to successfully retrofit your community buildings. Um, so Juliana, Patrick, thank you. Thank you both for, for being here and I will uh, now hand the floor over to you. Thanks Yvonne and thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope that you're all staying safe and healthy during these pretty challenging times. For today, we're very excited to be able to provide you with an overview of our new funding offer, the Community Buildings Retrofit Initiative, also known as CBR, that launched actually just a couple of weeks ago. So let's dive right in. So you'll notice that through our initiative name, this funding offer is specifically geared towards community buildings. And what we typically mean by those types of buildings is that they need to serve some form of community purpose, whether that's recreational services like indoor arenas and indoor pools or community centers, but they could also serve cultural and social services that facilities such as libraries and art centers provide. As you know, these types of buildings are really at the heart of Canadian communities and they deliver really important benefits to their residents. These facilities, as you know, also tend to use a high amount of energy and cost a ton to operate. So for example, we can see in um, the pie chart here that more than one third of energy use in municipal facilities on average comes from either municipal ice rinks or community and recreation centers. As a result, the cost to run and operate these buildings is quite high and even more so if they're not operating optimally. So depending on the types of fuel used to heat your buildings or on your local sources of electricity, these buildings can be a significant source and driver of GHG emissions uh, for, for municipalities across the country. Another reason to focus on community buildings, on the next slide please, um, is that making the types of improvements that are needed to reduce GHGs and save money can easily be paired with planned repairs and ongoing maintenance. So according to the Canadian Infrastructure Report Card, one in three recreational or cultural facilities in Canada are deemed very poor, poor or in fair condition, meaning that they're either in need of repair, requiring upgrades in the next five to 10 years, or are aging and will require action in the medium to long term. So a challenge here is that repairs are costly and many communities have limited capacity to make these changes. So deciding when and how to make these restorations and other improvements requires a careful evaluation and prioritization. Let's take a short pause here and take another quick poll on who out there thinks that they may have a facility that fits the bill for this offer. So specifically, we're interested in hearing whether your community has a building in need of repair or upgrades. And some of the choices we have are, yes, you have several buildings that are in need of repair or upgrades. You may have maybe one to two buildings in need of upgrades, but most are in good conditions. Or alternatively, some of your buildings will need upgrades and in the, med in the medium to long term, but nothing in the near future. So we're just going to wait a couple more moments for the last few responses and if we could please share the results. Okay, so it seems like the vast majority of you uh, have several buildings in need of repair or upgrades and a few of you, um, less than a third have one to two and the minority unsurprisingly have a few buildings that uh, will need to be upgraded in the near to long term. So thanks for providing your input. It provides a bit of a snapshot as to who's joined us today. Um, otherwise, on the next slide, please, um, 
So despite some of the challenges uh, that have arisen, there are many improvements that you can make to optimize the performance of your buildings and reduce GHGs. So we do offer support to help your municipality save money right away and also over the long term, which in turn may improve the delivery of community services and GMF is here to support and help you along this entire journey. So I'll pass it over to Patrick, who'll provide some background on the CBR initiative. Excellent, thanks very much, Juliana. And hello to everybody. It's, it's great to see so many people that are attending. I'm seeing a lot of very familiar names, so it's really great. Um, and, and as we saw from that poll that just came through, this is obviously a need for so many communities. So in terms of how FCM could help, as you can guess, it's, it's introducing this new community building retrofit, or I'll refer to it as the acronym CBR. So the CBR initiative supports municipal as well as non-for-profit organizations that own and operate community buildings in optimizing the energy performance of those buildings and measurably reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Now, uh, CBR's mission is to support municipalities and, and their nonprofit partners in achieving a, those triple bottom line benefits through the retrofitting of these buildings that are heavily used by community members. So when we're talking about triple bottom line benefits, of course, we're looking at one, the environmental. So, so reducing those emissions in, in those types of buildings. Um, there's the, the economic, so lowering those operating costs. Um, extending the life of use and, and as well as creating local jobs. And, you know, when we're looking at these types of public facing buildings, of course, the social um, aspect is, is equally important. So improving the building quality and supporting the community use. CBR is a $167 million initiative is made possible uh, through the federal government contribution of $950 million as part of budget 2019. Um, so the program is designed to be stackable with other funding programs, including those that might be available through uh, in your relevant provinces and territories. Um, this is also a reference, but I wanted to note that um, part of that larger contribution in the 2019 budget, there was a portion set aside for seven major urban centers uh, in Canada for establishing a collaboration with Low Carbon Cities Canada. So these seven centers include the cities of Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and finally the Halifax Regional Municipality. So as um, these seven centers have specific funding set aside, um, they, as well as nonprofits within their boundaries, are ineligible for CBR funding. So, you kind of probably already have a pretty good idea here, but this is but what do we consider community buildings under the CBR initiative? So they're defined as an enclosed public place or enclosed workplace that is A, owned by a municipal government or nonprofit, B, that is primarily used for the purposes of providing athletic, recreational, cultural, and community programs or services to the local community. And, and finally, C, to which the public is normally allowed access. Now, one thing I do want to highlight here is that uh, we are talking about enclosed spaces. So um, outdoor swimming pools and arenas, for example, would likely not be eligible. Um, so in terms of the types, again, you can see here on the screen, we're going to, we, we imagine to see a lot of arenas and ice rinks and pools and recreation centers. Uh, clubhouses, gyms, halls, curling rinks, you, know, you name it. There's lots of um, building typology that could come under this, this, this definition for us. I'm going to pass it back to Juliana here. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the, the CBR initiative is really designed to support your municipality along the journey of optimizing the performance of your existing community buildings, depending on which of these phases you may find yourself. So I'll be walking you through what each of these stages entail. And Patrick will be providing you with some relevant examples of projects as well as specific funding opportunities that are available through this funding stream. So let's kick it off with our first step, which is to better understand your building's performance. How do we do this? 
Essentially, this is really done through building monitoring and analysis. This is really a key step to undertake when charting out a path to improve the energy performance of your buildings. It typically involves monitoring the energy performance of your buildings to understand how they currently use energy and how their energy use varies year to year, as well as through different seasonal changes. Benchmarking and comparing your building's energy performance against that of similar buildings within your municipality or potentially in other uh, neighboring communities. Identifying simple ways to conserve energy, which can help you save uh, on costs and uh, tracking and reporting on performance over time after these conservation measures have been implemented to understand the impact they have on your GHG emissions. The building monitoring and analysis will typically involve adopting a building energy management system, which helps to monitor and control energy use, as well as help maintain occupant comfort. These systems tend to collect data from building equipment like heating, ventilation and air conditioning equipment, pumps and fans, energy meters or submeters, and building sensors. So depending on their specific functionality, facility managers can use these systems to view performance data in real time, modify HVAC or lighting systems based on demand or occupancy levels, and they can even detect faults or issues with building systems. Patrick, over to you. Thank you very much. So yeah, so we wanted to show a, a few examples um, for each of these these, these funding uh, stages. So this first one is is comes to us from the city of Mississauga. Um, this is one example of a municipality that has done extensive work on energy monitoring, benchmarking, and analysis. Uh, the city uses real time building level metering of electricity, natural gas, and water in twenty one of its highest consuming buildings. So the city uses a, a utility monitoring system and a building automation system to track energy data and understand its building performance. For each facility, the city compares its current energy usage to its past energy usage to evaluate performance against its historical baseline. This allows them to understand if and how performance has improved over time. In addition to comparing buildings against historical performance, they also use industry standards to benchmark their performance and set targets. The city is also testing uh, the sub-metering capabilities of refrigeration plant equipment at three of their local arenas to better understand the energy consumption and costs. In 2016, they undertook a pilot at one of their arenas, currently shown here, the Iceland Arena, um, to, to identify opportunities to optimize and improve its performance. This involved installing a portable data logger to track real-time electricity consumption of their ice plant equipment. And subsequently, they were able to make small adjustments to their equipment schedule, which was a change that actually resulted in over 20% decrease in electricity consumption in the winter and an annual savings of almost $40,000. So moving on to um, how the CBR initiative, next slide please, um, can, uh, can, can help um, support your municipalities to take on a similar challenge. So through the CBR, you can apply for grants of up to $25,000 to cover up to 80% of eligible costs for establishing a building monitoring and analysis system. So grants are targeted to owners of community buildings that do not currently have these types of systems in place. And the two activities required uh, to, to be eligible for this grant include uh, first the setup and use of energy management software, as well as doing some building energy benchmarking. On top of that, however, the project may also include services to support those activities or help you analyze the results, um, identifying energy conservation measures, as well as procurement and installation of sub-metering systems. One important point uh, to bring to, to, to your attention here is that only one of these grants will be available per municipality. So you may wanna consider if you're applying, use a portfolio of buildings, use more than one building. This, helps, this will help support your business case for the ongoing monitoring analysis costs, which typically take the form of, uh, of yearly service fees. Back to you, Juliana. 
Thanks, Patrick. So let's take a look at the next step, which is to optimize your existing building systems uh, to ensure that your buildings are operating as efficiently as possible. When we talk about optimizing your buildings, we typically are referring to building recommissioning. Recommissioning your existing buildings, which is often uh, abbreviated to EBCX, is one of the most economical ways to reduce energy and GHG emissions, and it can also save you from making unnecessary upgrades to building systems. So this typically involves assessing how equipment and systems are currently operating and finding simple ways to improve or maintain your performance. Most optimization measures are low cost or no cost solutions to address underlying integration issues. These type of low hanging fruit measures can have a surprisingly high impact on the building's energy performance, between five to 15% for the whole building. And uh, it has a relatively short payback period, typically less than three years. So there is a strong value proposition for undertaking uh, recommissioning work. The types of improvements that you can make through recommissioning can also have other benefits besides energy performance, including improving occupant comfort, reducing maintenance costs, and extending equipment life. So if you were to look at the different, uh, the two different types of commissioning, um, you, may, you may have heard of a small distinction between recommissioning and retro commissioning. Recommissioning is a reoptimization process for existing buildings. So it seeks to improve how building equipment and systems are operating to meet building use requirements and expectations. As previously mentioned, this is done by identifying problems and integration issues, as well as low cost or no cost operational improvements. This process can be either undertaken alone or along with a capital retrofit project. Retro commissioning is, is like recommissioning, but it applies to an existing building that wasn't originally commissioned. So this can be done, uh, this can be actually a more complicated process because of lack of prior commissioning data. You'll often hear us uh, refer to recommissioning, but we consider both recommissioning and retro commissioning within the CBR offer. Next slide. So, Again, back to a little example here for you. So this one is coming from Nova Scotia and the city of Halifax. And uh, this is an example of a community who's completing uh, recommissioning projects in its municipal facilities, including the Gordon Snow Community Center that you see here in the image, an indoor pool, and a sports stadium. In addition to recommissioning, several of these buildings have also undergone retrofits to complete LED lighting upgrades at the same time, showing that you can pair this work with planned upgrades. As a result of this work, each building has seen substantial energy and cost savings. For example, each building has achieved between fourteen dollars and $95,000 in savings. And together, the three buildings have reduced annual emissions, an equivalent of taking 165 cars off the road. Apart from the existing recommissioning projects, the same buildings have other planned measures like ventilation and pumping optimization, building automation and lighting controls that will achieve additional GHG and cost benefits. Recommissioning work for this specific uh, example is being completed through Efficiency Nova Scotia's Building Optimization Program, which provides incentives for municipalities in the province to complete studies and implement low and no cost operational improvements to the building. Next slide, please. So onto the funding, the direct funding from us. So in terms of our support for building commissioning, uh, we will be offering grants that cover up to 60% of project costs, the maximum here being $55,000. Uh, typically these, these types of projects are gonna include four phases. So uh, planning, investigation, uh, then your implementation, and finally the handoff. So over the course of these phases, building owners um, define the scope of work, find and prioritize opportunities for improvement, implement the improvements, and then finally develop a strategy to maintain the building performance over time. If you are applying or interested in applying for this community building recommissioning grant and meet the eligibility criteria for the community building and monitoring analysis grant, so the, the, the one we just talked about, um, you are encouraged to apply for both at the same time. Now, as with the building monitoring and analysis grant, only one community building uh, recommissioning project is eligible uh, per municipality. 
and, and I should have mentioned before, that's regardless of whether the included building or buildings are owned by the municipality or a nonprofit organization. So it, to give an example of that, that would be, let's say, a nonprofit uh, in the city of uh, Saskatoon decides to apply for one of these uh, grants that would, uh, and, and they're approved, that would make the, the city of Saskatoon itself ineligible to apply. So what we will have is uh, for any municipal partners applying, the municipality um, that they're partnering with will have to um, support them in that, acknowledging that they would not be able to apply going forward. So that's just a distinction I wanted to, uh, to highlight. Um, so for uh, finally for a project like this to be eligible, we also require that recommissioning projects are conducted by qualified professional with, uh, with demonstrated experience completing these types of projects. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so let's move on to our third stage. Uh, the next step is really to study how you can improve uh, your building performance over the long term by identifying what your retrofit options are and when you would implement them. This uh, approach to retrofitting allows you to integrate energy and GHG considerations into the longer term planning and management of your building assets. It typically involves feasibility work to support both near-term and long-term capital projects, while also mapping a course to extend asset life and reduce cost of ownership or uh, the total capital operating and maintenance costs over the building's remaining useful life. This differs from the standard way of planning retrofits because the emphasis is really put on the long-term thinking and determining what upgrades are most appropriate and when especially to ensure that not only you are achieving GHG reductions, but maximizing other cost benefits as well. For example, this might involve planning to upgrade your HVAC systems at their end of life, which could be at a later phase, rather than making a costly upgrade in the near term while the systems are still fully functional. To achieve deep GHG reductions, the feasibility work also involves determining a sequence of upgrades that will progressively bring your buildings closer to net zero emissions. And we refer to this sequence here as the GHG reduction pathway. To show you an example of what a GHG reduction pathway might look like uh, on the next slide, please. Um, each phase addresses one or more measures to improve building performance starting with low cost measures with high rates of return. So things like commissioning and lighting. In subsequent steps, the building owner may, take, may make changes to the building envelope, heat recovery systems, and so on to address critical building maintenance issues and continue reducing emissions. So just to highlight that this is only one example of a GHG reduction pathway and your own pathway would reflect your unique objectives, constraints and preferred measures within your community. So some of these GHG reduction pathways include multiple phases such as this one, whereas others may include a single more extensive retrofit uh, to meet the environmental targets that Patrick will speak to in a little while. So I think we're gonna take a pause here for another poll. Patrick, over to you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's sort of a little um, a brief explanation of what we're we, we've defined, a, a, excuse me, defined as this GHG reduction pathway. So, we're curious to know: is this type of approach something that is familiar to you and your municipalities? So, as you can see on the poll here, we're, we're you could say yes. You know, this is our typical approach that we do in planning retrofits, or or maybe you consider some of these elements but but haven't formalized the approach. Or, or this is completely the first time you've heard about this this sort of pathway approach. So I'll give uh, give a few seconds here, a few moments to uh, to let everyone have a chance to answer. All right, Let's see what results we have here. Okay. So it's, uh, it's it's fairly balanced with about half saying that it's 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 elements that uh, you do think about and do do incorporate but maybe not in uh, as formalized approach as, as this um, and then you know about a third saying that this is sort of the first time you're, you're hearing about this um, with with uh, about 20 percent saying this is sort of 
yes, this is similar to, to the approaches you currently take. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so I'm going to go on. I'm going to share another example and I get kind of into, again into a bit of the, the funding side of it. But, uh, but thank you for, uh, for taking part in that. So our um, example here is going to come from the town of Halton Hills, which is in Ontario. Um, and it's really a pretty concrete example of this type of pathway. So so Halton Hills is one municipality uh, and they began applying this sort of long-term planning lens uh, to, to retrofitting its buildings. Um, the town has adopted a net zero carbon target for 2030 and outlines a series of actions necessary to achieve this in its low carbon transition strategy, which includes deep decarbonization of all aspects of the town's GHG emissions across municipal sectors, including of course their buildings. Um, the town has also grappled with rising costs of community facilities due to the cost of electricity, uh, rapid population growth, and uh, the expansion of its community building stock. So to help tackle this challenge, the town completed energy audits of roughly half of its community facilities to understand their energy and GHG data and benchmark them against uh, others of comparable size and use. They then extrapolated trends from the audits to estimate energy use for the remaining facilities, develop energy use targets for each building, and create a list of possible measures to meet these targets. For each individual measure, the town calculated the costs, the payback period, and the energy and GHG savings associated with it. Common measures include lighting audits and retrofits and optimizing HVAC controls and systems, installing building automation systems, and, and others. Now, as part of this work, uh, planning out its retrofit, the town created a low carbon design brief for its town hall. This brief outlines a 10 year plan to achieve zero carbon building certification and includes several uh, different retrofit options with recommendations, life cycle costs and financial analysis. It also set out a roadmap for retrofitting the town's other facilities and sets standard for a new way of evaluating options for future capital projects. Holden Hills plans to use a similar approach to design work plans for its other priority buildings and complete these upgrades by 2030. Um, so on, on the next slide, I'll kind of get into a bit of how the, how the funding works, of course, again. So this uh, CBR grant uh, for feasibility studies um, that, that, that look to explore the GHG reduction pathway approach um, can provide up to $65,000 uh, for a single building and $200,000 for a portfolio building, as long as the average cost, it doesn't exceed 65 per building. Um, again, like our, our, our first grant, it can cover up to 80% of eligible costs. Uh, so these studies will really enable, as, as you've, as you've got, probably gathered municipalities and nonprofits to, um, to identify a sequence, again, using that word of GHG reduction measures that will achieve near net zero emissions. So, what do we mean when we mean near net zero emissions? So the definition here that we're, we're working with is that uh, these sequence of events will lead to at least a 50% reduction in emissions identified within the next 10 years and at least 80% reduction within 20 years. The study should also explore how to manage capital costs and reduce operating costs. This means that studies should not only identify a plan to achieve GHG reductions, but also evaluate alternative options project timing, funding opportunities, and other factors that can help improve the financial sustainability and operational outcomes of this reduction pathway. So as uh, Juliana mentioned, you know, it's, it's depending on the, the, the location, the type of building, these, these pathways can look very different, um, but this study enables you to kind of look at, at several different scenarios that could lead to that, that, that outcome of near net zero within minimum or maximum 20 years kind of idea. So overall, the goal is, is, is really is that, is to help you make early informed decisions on your capital planning, align this with your asset management, sustainability and climate goals, so that from the outset, you are, you, you, you know, your capital project ready. Um, I will know and we'll touch on it later, but to help support in developing the, these pathway studies, uh, we are developed or we have developed a technical guidance document it will be published in a few weeks, um, and it really outlines the key recommendations and best practices for these types of studies. We do have an advanced copy as well if you want to reach out uh, and are interested in, uh, in getting started a little quicker. Okay, on to the next one. 
Great. So finally, the, the last step is to actually implement the capital upgrades and to begin achieving those GHG and cost savings. After doing all the legwork to better understand and optimize your building performance, after identifying a process to complete upgrades that reduce emissions, while also improving building operation and maintenance, as well as saving costs, the next step is then to begin the implementation. So this may involve taking on the first stage of your GHG reduction pathway, whether that's lighting upgrades or something else, or potentially doing a full deep retrofit as one comprehensive step. So Patrick uh, will be providing some examples of that. Um, yeah, go to the next slide, please. There we go. Um, so this example is coming to us from the village of Midway in British Columbia. Um, so, you know, lots of municipalities are doing great work in their community buildings to, to achieve these sort of deep GHG reductions. And, and we really thought that this one from Midway was a shining example. So Midway is in the process of retrofitting their community center, uh, which was used as, as an important hub for emergency services during the wildfires in 2015, for example, and they're looking to, to turn this into a net zero facility. The village uh, so far has completed a level one energy audit, which recommended a series of efficiency and technology improvements uh, that will enable the facility to become carbon neutral. The project will implement demand side reductions, such as LED light fixture replacements, window conversions to triple pane glass, uh, heating optimization controls, and, and others. It will incorporate fuel switching strategies as well, such as uh, air source heat pump system and integrating uh, solar photovoltaic generation for use and selling back to the grid. Uh, building automation systems will also play a pivotal role in maximizing the efficiency of the building, monitoring the system for any issues of concern, notifying operations of any problems, and measuring, or excuse me, measuring the facility performance. Uh, the retrofit project is championed by the Midway Community Hall Renovation Committee and is also supported through the village's official community plan. So this is from a population of less than 700 people and it, it's really a great example of leadership in, in a smaller community. Now, to explain our, our capital funding and how that works, there's actually sort of two branches of this funding that can be available. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So the first one is our capital project GHG impact retrofit is what we're calling it. So to help impact, or excuse me, to help implement your upgrades, um, uh, the first is this impact uh, capital project. And these projects are, are set to aim to reduce GHG emissions by at least 30% compared to current baseline. Um, projects are eligible for a combination of loan and grant funding up to a combined maximum of $5 million and again up to 80% of eligible costs. So to put that in, in quick math, if you have a project that's $5 million, we would be able to cover up to 80%, so $4 million. And then within that $4 million, you're getting a 75% loan and a 25% grant. So in total, you'd be getting a $3 million loan, a $1 million grant, and the last 20%, $1 million, would be um, either stackable with other funding or coming directly from, uh, from, from the municipality itself. Um, so retrofits of, of portfolio buildings are also eligible, so it doesn't have to be limited to just one. Um, and we are also including, if you are taking a portfolio approach, the, the flexibility to add in non-community buildings. So as long as within your portfolio, you have at least a community building, you can also include others, for example, uh, you know, administration buildings and wastewater treatment plants and, and fire halls and, and on and on and on. So it, that portfolio approach does allow for a little bit more flexibility there. Um, it's also worth noting that from this 30%, uh, only a third of it can come from renewable energy. Uh, so at least two thirds must come from, from efficiency and, and fuel switching. Um, and, and again, just for this GSG impact retrofit, it is sort of designed for projects that may be uh, shovel ready now that haven't followed this, this GSG reduction pathway approach. So we just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, projects that are more shovel ready, let's say, uh, do have access to the funding. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. 
Um, so the second branch of this, is, as you, you, you might have uh, might have predicted, is, is to support the GSG reduction pathway. So this would be to implement one or more phases that have been identified through your pathway. Now, this can come through either, uh, you know, first applying for, for our supported uh, reduction pathway study, or if you believe you have an equivalent study or the equivalent information now, you can also use that to apply. Um, so similar to the previous capital project, the, the funding is identical in terms of amounts and percentages, and the portfolio building approach is also acceptable. Um, so obviously the key difference here is that your, your funding application must include um, at least one of those retrofit phases identified in your pathway or a combination of GHG reduction measures identified in the pathway that are appropriately sequenced. Um, if you're approved for this funding, you can also come back and apply for additional uh, subsequent phases in the future, um, you know, as, as, as funding exists with us. Um, so it's really here to support that stage implementation of your, of your retrofit work rather than just sort of a one-off single project. So quickly, just a recap of our funding opportunities here. So we have sort of four options, and then within those four options, there's there's the two capital projects. So uh, starting, you know, improving ideation, the building monitoring and assessment, or excuse me, building monitoring analysis grant, uh, the building commissioning, recommissioning, retro commissioning grant, uh, that GHG reduction pathway study, and then the two capital projects that I just spoke to. Next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit here on the applicant eligibility uh, for the Green Municipal Fund. Um, basically, there are two types of applicants, either municipal governments or municipal partners. Now you see there is a list here under municipal partners of, of certain types. So uh, private sector, indigenous communities, uh, municipally owned corporations and so on. Um, so they are eligible to apply uh, in partnership with a municipal government. However, remember that the buildings themselves need to be owned by either municipal governments or nonprofits. So we anticipate in most scenarios, it's gonna be one or the other of those two entity types that will be applying. Next slide, please. Won't get too, uh, too, in, too into the weeds here on this, but this is just to give you a little bit of idea of sort of how our project evaluation uh, criteria is. Uh, it's, it's sort of separated into three broad um, section, so impact, implementation, and transformative potential. Um, impact, by impact, we mean that the project has the potential to generate measurable environmental benefits, both qualitative and quantitative, as well as other benefits related to decreasing energy costs, supporting community benefits, and other sustainable practices. Implementation focuses on the project or study approach. So it's, it's, it's designed holistically with strong project management, are there strong elements of stakeholder engagement, risk management, and uh, as well as the work plan and budgeting and, and so on. And then lastly, we have our transformative potential, which considers if the project um, exemplifies innovation and market transformation by demonstrating or adopting new and better solutions uh, and ultimately encouraging replication by other communities, which is, is um, a large part of our mandate at the Green Municipal Fund. Next slide, please. Um, so this might be a question a lot of you have asked, and I see a couple in the chat there of, of how to apply. So first I would say that visit our, our CBR webpage. It can be uh, found at fcm.ca slash community building retrofits. Um, we have a detailed application guide, which is available online from that webpage there. Um, it, it really lays out a lot more of these, these uh, funding products and, and resources in, in a lot more detail than you're gonna get. Uh, you know, in a, in a quick presentation like this. So I really encourage you to take a look at it. Um, one thing to note that for building uh, monitoring and analysis, as well as recommissioning grants, the application forms are available right online. So you can go and apply to those immediately. I still encourage you to reach out to us if you have questions, just to make sure that you're, you're you know, um, you're eligible and, and all that. Um, for the studies and the capital projects, we do have uh, an extra step of a pre-application form that is submitted to us that we do go through and aim to get back to you sort of within 15 business days or less to confirm your eligibility. So the idea here is just to make sure that we're, 
you know, you're not going ahead and doing a whole lot of work if, it, if it's not uh, aligned with the program. So again, very much encourage you to reach out before you apply if you're unsure of anything. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Juliana just quickly to touch on some key resources. Sure. Thanks, uh, Patrick. Uh, so essentially to help get you all started on thinking about some of these ideas, or even if you're building on your learning, there are a few resources and tools online that can help you. So for example, uh, Natural Resources Canada has a number of great resources on energy benchmarking available, as well as on building commissioning, and it also includes a few case studies as well. We also have the GMF Municipal Energy Roadmap, which was published just last year, and it, it does provide a series of recommendations and estimates of GHG and financial impacts related to upgrades in municipal buildings, uh, and it has uh, specific information uh, geared towards the municipal indoor ice rinks. And uh, as Patrick has mentioned, so we have produced the technical guidance documents on the GHG reduction pathway study, which should be coming on the website in just a, a few weeks. Uh, but if you're interested, you could reach out and we could provide you with an advanced copy. It does provide a series of requirements and recommendations for, for what to consider when completing these studies. So it is helpful if you're considering uh, doing a project within this stream. Um, on the next slide, just wanted to give a little uh, overview of some of the additional resources and support uh, to help you plan, implement, and monitor the results of these retrofit projects. Uh, and I did see a question in the chat about uh, some of these initiatives. So they are upcoming and they are planned uh, within the next months or in the next coming years as well. Uh, so that includes two case studies about Halton Hill's work uh, to introduce the concept of the GHG reduction pathway study. So what Patrick talked about. Um, so that will be coming up in the next couple of months. We're also planning a curated online library of relevant resources, courses, and training opportunities to help you build your business case and retrofit your community buildings. We also plan on eventually sharing a list of complementary funding programs that can be stacked with CBR funding. And uh, what else is on the docket is uh, access to regional and national partners that can provide technical and administrative support to help you plan and implement your community building retrofits. Awesome. So yeah, that, that, that's basically it for, for today for us. We want to leave a bit of time for questions, of course. I see a tons in the, in the chat, which is really great. Um, so this is just to remind you that, uh, encourage you, you know, to reach out to us. Um, you, can, you can email us at gmfinfo at fcm.ca. Uh, you can call us at the number on the screen. Um, again, the program information is available uh, at that link there. And, um, if you haven't already, really uh, encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. It, it provides a lot of late, um, the most up-to-date um, resources and announcements from, from across FCM programming. So um, we're going to turn it over back to Yvonne here, I believe, for a couple of questions. And, and again, if we don't get to your question, uh, we will look to reach out and or connect with you in, in one way or another. Great, thank you so much, Patrick, and, and thank you, Juliana. I uh, most appreciate you being here to uh, to answer these questions and uh, and give us all this great information. Um, so yeah, as you said, there's lots of questions in the chat. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a lightning round here to get through some of them. Um, so so thank you for your patience as we go through these. And and as Patrick said, if we don't get to your question, you can definitely reach out to us directly. Um, so there's quite a few questions that came in uh, specific to applicant eligibility. Uh, a couple of these I think you addressed later in the presentation, um, but just to, to, to narrow in on a few of these. Um, are regional districts specifically also eligible, or is when you say municipality, does that uh, exclude regional districts? Uh, yeah, so typically regional districts are, are considered uh, municipal entities under our funding, so there shouldn't, shouldn't be an issue there. I, I would note, however, that if a regional district is applying for a building within a certain municipality, then that municipality couldn't also apply. So it would have to still follow that um, one per municipality uh, framework. Great. And then there was another question about uh, specifically in Ontario, are conservation authorities considered eligible for this program? Um, that's a good question. So conservation authorities likely uh, could be a, a, a within a partnership of uh, municipalities if they are um, you know, supporting um, community buildings that are either owned by a municipality or, or nonprofit. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, and then there's also quite a, quite a number of specific questions around building eligibility. Um, there's a few that came in that were, were quite specific about uh, certain projects. So I, I would certainly recommend if you have a specific project in mind to, to reach out to Patrick and, and he can, uh, can sit down with you and, and talk about the specifics. Um, but a couple other building types that came up were things like churches and schools, um, museums, um, municipal office buildings, for example, that are located in a section of a community building. Can you comment a little bit more on, on those types of projects and that might what might be eligible in, in that respect? Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of specific ones, museums, uh, yes, they would be. Uh, when it comes to churches and schools, it's likely not. Um, however, uh, in certain circumstances that it, they might be able to be part of a, a you know a larger portfolio. Um, admin infrastructure within a larger complex uh, would be eligible as, as long as they're they're sort of applying together as one building, I guess I would say. Um, so I think in a lot of those cases, the, the best case would be to, to, uh, to bring it as a portfolio approach with uh, an established community building. Okay, great. And there's a couple of questions I think that would sort of fall under what I, I, I would consider a hybrid approach. Uh, for example, uh, you mentioned outdoor swimming pools would not be eligible. Um, but if you wanted to, for example, convert an outdoor pool uh, to an indoor swimming pool, was that something that would be considered? Um, so that would be more considered uh, like a new build for us. So um, it, it probably wouldn't be uh, eligible. Um, it needs to be able to show a baseline uh, GHG uh, emissions and then what your anticipated reduction would be. So adding an enclosure over an outdoor swimming pool would uh, it would change sort of the the use, I guess, not the use, but you know what I mean? It's like a sort of, it'd be hard to, to, to work through that. So I would say no. Um, in situations where there is an outdoor facility that is attached to an indoor facility and they share, uh, you know, certain common energy systems like a geothermal system, for example, that could be a scenario where it, it could, um, could include sort of that parts of those outdoor features as well. Okay, great. And similarly, a, a capital project uh, that includes additions to an existing building, would that fall under the same kind of lens of, of considering more of a new building than, than a retrofit project? Yeah, exactly. That would fall more under a new build. However, similar to what I just said, if there is, um, if, if there are certain systems that are applicable to both, um, then it, it, it portions of that new build, I guess I could say, would could be eligible as long as the existing part is is the focus of the retrofit. Um, I will also point out too that FCM funding does support uh, new builds, uh, not through the CBR, but through our core funding that was mentioned earlier. So if you do have an addition that is, is uh, targeting net zero energy, then it may be eligible through that other uh, source of funding. Okay, that's great. And there, there actually was a question on that note uh, with respect to our other funding streams. Can you comment at all about um, you know, any proposals related to community buildings, do they all go through the CBR stream or are there still active program areas that through our, our core funding program that would cover other community related projects? Uh, so when it comes to community buildings, um, specifically, they, they will all go through CBR if it's a retrofit. As I just mentioned there, if it's a new build community facility, then it could go through our core funding in terms of uh, targeting net zero energy. Um, the only exception to the rule, I would say, would be the um, those, those seven urban centers that I, I defined earlier, who, as they're not eligible for, for CBR, they could come through our, our typical uh, core funding as well. Excellent. Um, there were also a number of questions uh, related to the building monitoring and uh, analysis stream specifically. Um, a couple people were asking about whether or not there was a preferred program or a specific uh, energy management and benchmarking software that uh, should be used for this type of analysis. For example, something like uh, Energy Star Portfolio Manager or a Red Screen Analysis. Um, is the funding prescriptive in that in that sense? Uh, so the funding isn't prescriptive uh, completely in that sense. Um, I think it might be something that that comes out of sort of our, our, our capacity development and resource work going forward that might uh, be able to shed light on, on some options that are out there. But at this point, um, we don't require one over the other or anything uh, specific. Okay, great. 
Uh, moving back to uh, the funding specifically, uh, there's also a few questions about um, stackability. Uh, for example, uh, there's there's been some you know new federal funding sources announced for community buildings. Um, how does CBR relate to that, and and is it is it stackable with other sources of, of grant funding from either from from GMF sources or, or elsewhere? Yeah. So in terms of stacking CBR funding with external sources, whether that's uh, from the federal government, the, the, the provinces and, and territories, or, or other, um, it is it is for the most part fully stackable in that sense. Um, when it comes to stacking with other FCM funding, uh, in most cases it would not be. Um, so if it's the same project and the same scope of work, we wouldn't give you 80% from CBR and cover the other 20% through our core funding, for example. So it is very specific to the project itself. So there can't be overlapping costs. Um, we do allow municipalities to apply more than once or for multiple applications at the same time. But again, that overlap um, has to be specific um, to not happen for, 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 for both of them to come together, if that makes sense. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. Um, that is very similar to there. There's a couple of questions related to the, the different stages that uh, that we talked about with respect to you know, moving from building monitoring analysis through recommissioning uh, into the study and then capital programs or capital projects. Um, are all of these stages uh, something that have to be applied for in sequence? You know, for example, is it okay to apply for um, a, a capital project or a study if you haven't yet done the benchmarking and recommissioning? Uh, through FCM, or, or what would be your comments on sort of how people can move in and out of this uh, this funding pathway? Uh, that's a that's a great question. I, I would say um, no. They, you don't have to follow in sequence. Um, you can. It, it's it's supposed to be designed that you can kind of come in at the point that makes the most sense uh, for your specific facility or municipality. Um, I would say that if, as I mentioned before, for instance, if you're going for a recommissioning grant, but also want to do the building monitoring assessment at the same time, you can apply for both of those. Um, and as well for the capital funding, there can be commissioning, recommissioning costs associated with that larger capital project. So there is opportunities to sort of um, do some of these in, in parallel, if you will. Um, but but yeah, I would say it's it's, the sequencing of these of these sort of four interventions uh, often do kind of flow into each other, specifically the, the building monitoring and analysis into the study work, because you're using a lot of that information you currently or that you generated through that that to um, to support your baselines and to support your identification of efficiency measures and so on. So there is sort of a natural way, but it isn't a requirement of us for you to start with one thing and, and to be able to go to the next thing. Um. Right. Oh, just, to, just to add a bit to Patrick's response, with respect to the capital project for the GHG reduction pathway, we do require uh, a feasibility study through the pathway uh, funding or an equivalent. So there is more information in the GHG guidance document on that for them to proceed to the capital project. And similarly, for the GHG impact, we require a feas feasibility study for that funding as well. Okay, great. Good point. Yes, there's lots of lots of very specific questions uh, about um, the, the specific uh, eligibility and, and you know sort of when when people can apply for different um, different streams and, and that kind of thing. So I, I think for for the remainder of those questions, just because we are tight on time, I, I would again encourage you to to reach out to us uh, via our email uh, or or uh, to Patrick directly. He's certainly happy to to talk with you about uh, about what might be possible for for your community. So I, I think we'll, we're gonna wrap up there just because again, we are tight on time. So I just wanna say a thank you to, to Juliana and, and Patrick for your, uh, for your time today and to all of you for, for your attendance and uh, your engagement. Uh, I can see that there are still lots of questions, uh, which is fantastic. So again, our contact information is on the screen. Um, please feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, before you go, we will also be sending a link uh, to, to a survey in the chat. Uh, this will also be in the follow-up email. Um, so you can, uh, if you could please take a few minutes to fill that out and provide us with your feedback, uh, that's, that's very helpful for us in, in shaping these webinars. Um, and that will also give you an opportunity to add any uh, additional questions that weren't answered today that we can follow up with you on directly. Um, as I mentioned, we will also be sharing those, uh, a few key takeaway slides as a resource. Um, those have been posted in, in the chat a few times throughout the session. Um, so you can use that to, to access the, the links to the website uh, and the application guide. Uh, as, along with um, some of the key uh, inf information packages about the different funding streams.
And again, uh, links are on the slide here, as well as to our weekly newsletter, which will provide you with uh, more updates as uh, new resources become available over time as well. Uh, so with that, thank you all again, and I uh, wish you a wonderful rest of your day.